Chapter 33 of The Exploits of Juve by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 A Scandal in the Cloister. Slight sounds, scarcely audible, disturbed the peace of the cloister. In the absolute silence of the night, vague noises could be distinguished furtive steps, whisperings, doors opened or shut cautiously. Then the blinking light of a candle shone at a casement. Two or three other windows were illuminated, and the hubbub grew general. Voices were heard, frightened interjections, the stir increased in the long corridor on which cells opened. Generally the curtains of these cells were discreetly drawn. Now they were being pulled aside. Drowsy faces looked out of the gloom. The excitement increased. "'Sister Marguerite! Sister Vincent! Sister Clotilde! What is it? What is happening? Listen!' The alarmed nuns gathered at the far end of the passage. The worthy women, roused from their rest, had hastily arranged their coifs and chastely wrapped themselves in their flowing robes. They turned their frightened faces toward the chapel. "'Burglars!' murmured the sister who was treasurer of the convent, thinking of the cup of gold that the humble little sister had preserved as a relic with jealous care. Another sister, recently come from the Cruz, from which she had been driven by the laws, did not conceal her fears. "'More emissaries of the government! They are going to turn us out!' The senior, Sister Vincent, quivering with alarm, stammered, "'It is a revolution! I saw that in seventy. A heap of chairs under the vaulting suddenly toppled down. Panic-stricken, the sisters crowded close together, not daring to go to the chapel, which was joined to the passage by a little staircase. "'And the Mother Superior! What did she think of it all? What would she say?' They drew near the cell, a little apart from the others, occupied by the lady who, on taking the headship of the house, had brought with her precious personal assistance and a good deal of money as well. Sister Vincent, who had gone forward and was about to enter the little chamber, drew back. "'Our Holy Mother,' she informed the others, "'is at her prayers.' At this very moment broken cries rang down the passage. Sister Frances, the janitress, who everyone believed was calmly slumbering in her lodge, suddenly appeared, her eyes wild, her garments in disarray. The sisters gathered round her, but the helpless woman shrieked quite beside herself. "'Let me go! Let us flee! I have seen the devil! He is here! In the church! It is frightful!' Mad with terror, the sister explained in disjointed phrases what had alarmed her. She had heard a noise and fancied it might be the gardener's dog shut by mistake in the chapel. Then behold, at the moment she entered the choir, the stained-glass window above the shrine of St. Clotilde, their patroness, suddenly gave way, and through the opening appeared a supernatural being who came toward her ejaculating words she could not understand. Armed with a great cudgel, he struck right and left, making a terrible uproar. Thereupon the janitress made an effort to escape, but the demon barred her path, and a sepulchral voice commanded her to go for the mother superior and bid her come at once if she did not want the worst of evils to fall upon the sisterhood. She had scarcely finished when an echoing crash was heard. The sisters suppressed a cry, and as they turned, pale with dread, before them stood their mother superior. With a sweeping gesture, she vaguely gave a blessing as if to endow them with courage, then turned to the janitress. My dear sister Francoise, calm yourself. Be brave. God will not forsake us. I intend to comply with the desire of the stranger. I will go alone, with God alone. Lady Beltham made a mighty effort to disguise the emotion she felt. Slowly she went down the steps and entered the sanctuary, where she halted in a state of terror. The choir was lit up, the tapers were flaring on the high altar, and in the middle of the chapel, wrapped in a large black cloak, his face hidden by a black mask, stood a man, mysterious and alarming. Lady Beltham? At the sound of this voice, Lady Beltham fancied she recognized her lover. "'What do you want? What are you doing? It is madness!' "'Nothing is madness in Fantomas.' Lady Beltham pressed her hands to her heart, unable to speak. The voice resumed. "'Fantomas bids you leave here, Lady Beltham. In two hours you will go from this convent. A closed motor will be waiting for you at the back of the garden, at the little gate. The vehicle will take you to a seaport.' where you will board a vessel which the driver will indicate. When the voyage is over, you will be in England. There you will receive fresh orders to make for Canada. Lady Beltham wrung her hands in despair. 
why do you wish to force me to leave my dear companions were you not ready to leave everything lady beltham to make a new life for yourself with him you love alas remember last tuesday night at the Nouet mansion ah you should have carried me off then not left me time to think it over now i am no longer willing you will go yes or no will you obey i will for after all i love you the two tragic beings were silent for a moment listening outside the church the uproar grew in violence brief orders were being shouted a blowing of whistles suddenly uttering a hoarse cry the ruffian exclaimed the police the police are on the track of fantomas juve's police well this time fantomas will be too much for him lady beltham till we meet again beating a rapid retreat behind a pillar of the chapel he vanished lady beltham found herself alone in the chapel five minutes later the heavy steps of the police sounded in the passages they went through the house searching for clues then disappeared in the darkness of the night lady beltham addressed the nuns a great peril threatens our sisters of the boulevard jourdain they must be warned at all costs and at once and it is necessary that i and i only should go to warn them have no fear no harm will happen to me i know what i am doing under the appalled eyes of the sisterhood the mother superior slowly passed from the assembled community with a sweeping gesture of farewell the moment she was alone she ran to the far end of the garden and passed through the little gate in the wall behind the chapel she was gone while these strange occurrences were in progress at the peaceful convent of nogent and the flight of lady beltham at the bidding of fantomas was effected under the eyes of the sisters no little stir was manifest in the environs of la chapelle in the dreaded region where the hooligans forming the celebrated gang of ciphers have their haunts a certain misrule reigned in the confederation due to the fact that lupart had not been seen for some time none of its members believed for an instant the newspaper story that lupart had turned out to be fantomas the elusive the superhuman the improbable the weird fantomas this was beyond them good enough to stuff the numb skull of the law with such a tale but there was no use for it among the gang of ciphers that same evening there was considerable excitement at the station in the rue stevenson detectives inspectors real or sham hooligans were assembled there who is that gentleman asked monsieur rocolet the commissionary of the district pointing to a young man seated in a corner of the room taking notes on a pad juve to whom the query was addressed turned his head why it's fandor jerome fandor my friend juve was seated at the magistrate's table comparing papers documents and material evidence he had standing round him men in uniform or mufti one might have thought at the office of a general staff during a battle the door opened to a man dressed like a market gardener well leon asked juve monsieur inspector it is done we have nabbed the cooper a sergeant of the nineteenth arrondissement appeared and saluted monsieur inspector my friend are bringing in the flirt her throat is cut is her murderer taken not yet there are several of them but we know them the wounded woman was able to tell us their names they bled her because they suspected her of giving us information monsieur rocolet telephoned to lerboisiere for an ambulance and the officers went to see the victim who was lying on a stretcher in the hall at that moment the sound of a struggle hurried juve to the entrance of the station some officers were hauling in a youth with a pallid complexion and wicked eyes fandor recognized the captive it's that little collegian who bit my finger the night of the marseilles express leon who had drawn near likewise identified the youth i know him that's mamille his account is settled he is jugged the half of the station filled once more an old woman dragged in forcibly was groaning and bawling at the top of her voice pack of swine isn't it shameful to treat a poor woman so monsieur superintendent explained one of the men we caught this woman mother toulouche in the act of stowing away in her bodice a bundle of banknotes just passed to her by a man here they are the constable handed the packet to the magistrate and fandor who was watching could not repress an exclamation oh notes in halves suppose they belong to monsieur Marte? allow me monsieur rocolet to look at the numbers in with mother toulouche cried the superintendent then rubbing his hands he turned to juve and cried a fine haul monsieur inspector what do you think but juve did not hear him 
he had drawn Fandor into a corner of the office and was explaining. I have done no more at present than have Lady Beltham shadowed, but I do not mean to arrest her. You see, if I ask Fusilier for a warrant against Lady Beltham, a person legally dead and buried more than two months ago, that excellent functionary would swallow his clerk, stool and all, in sheer amazement. At that moment a cyclist constable, dripping with sweat and quite out of breath, came in and hastening straight to Juve cried, I come from Nogent. Well? Well, Monsieur Inspector, they saw a masked man come out of the convent, wrapped in a big cloak. They gave chase. He fired a revolver twice and killed two officers. Good God! It was certainly... We thought, too, that perhaps, after all, it was... It was Fantomas. Juve! called the commissary. You are wanted on the telephone. Nouet is asking for you. The detective picked up the receiver. Hello? Hello? Is that you, Michel? Yes. What? What is it? In a motor? Oh, you have taken the driver. But he... Curse it! Who the devil is this man who always escapes us? What? He is in Lady Beltham's house? You have surrounded the house? Good. Keep your eyes open. Do nothing till I come. Juve hung up the receiver and turned to Fandor. Fantomas is at Lady Beltham's, shut up in the house. I am going there. I'll go with you. As the two men left the station, they were met by Inspector Grohl. "'We have taken the beard at Daddy Corns,' he cried. "'Confound that!' shouted Juve, as he jumped into a taxi with Fandor. "'Nouet! Boulevard Inkerman and top speed!' End of chapter 33